Warm welcome to all of our uh, distinguished participants who have joined us this morning and returned for the third week of our virtual academic program on enhancing security and justice coordination to counter transnational organized crime. As you all know by now, I'm Dr. Catherine Lena Kelly. I'm the Associate Professor of Justice and Rule of Law here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies and the faculty lead on this program. And I am here to moderate our third plenary session today, which will be about using regional and cross-border coordination to counter transnational organized crime. Uh, we will have with us today, and some of them are on the virtual dais with me right now. For this panel, we have Dr. Tarek Sharif, Executive Director of the African Union uh, Mechanism for Police Cooperation. Dr. Mutoy Mubiela, Associate Professor at University of Kinshasa and former Human Rights Specialist for the Office of the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights. And Commander Abebe Mulune, Director of EGAD Security Sector Program. Um, let me give you a few summary takeaways of last week, and then we'll jump into our panel. Last week, we considered what kinds of benefits and challenges there are for security and justice actors who are trying to implement interagency and interministerial forms of coordination to counter transnational organized crime in their countries. And we heard from several very interesting and distinguished speakers. Ms. Samira Guide from Somalia, who had worked in the office of the prime minister, to coordinate uh, the security sector in the context of responding to Al-Shabaab, which itself engages in a variety of transnational organized criminal activities. We heard from senior captain Jamel Ben Omran with the Tunisian Navy, who told us about their new secretariat for the sea that coordinates work on maritime security challenges, including transnational organized crime issues. And we heard from Mr. Brice Severin Pongui, a lawyer and an arbitrator from Republic of Congo, who is in the process of leading a multi-stakeholder working group on countering illegal logging that is supported by the U.S. Forest Service, um, but is also attached to the Congolese Ministry of Forests. We heard from them about the strategic value of having institutions that are designed to coordinate national authorities and streamline roles and responsibilities for dealing with transnational organized crime. There are many different ways that countries seem to be going about this, though. In Somalia, we had the Office of the Prime Minister, which started by elaborating a national security architecture and then dividing up responsibilities between national and regional councils and regional technical committees in order to coordinate a response, um, as, as Samira told us last week. In Tunisia, the Secretariat of the Sea has ministerial representatives from a variety of sectors and is working to harmonize how different agencies' capabilities are used in relation to the resources that are allocated to each of these agencies. And in Congo, we saw security, justice, financial, customs, and civil society of actors working together in the group to coordinate audits of the forest in Congo as part of efforts to address illegal logging. And um, this is all part of a Ministry of Forest-led effort to coordinate responses to single and repeat offenses um, related to illegal logging. Um, and the single and repeat offenses, we found out, are treated differently under Congolese law and therefore require different kinds of actors' involvement in order to work through the issue. We also heard about how both institutions and people-to-people -people interactions matter for breaking down some of these silos between different institutions that have a stake in countering transnational organized crime. We learned that there are challenges that can arise in relation to um, information that would be useful to share, but that some agencies might consider secret or sensitive. Uh, we also heard about how furthering mutual trust and communication between different interagency actors, maybe even informally through professional networks or joint trainings, can sometimes help to build up relationships of trust that could eventually ease competition between actors with useful information they could be sharing with each other, and it could further their complementarity or their collaboration instead over time. And finally, we heard how there needs to be room for more permanent dialogue that is both formal and informal between security sector and justice sector officials, as well as relevant counterparts coming from other ministries that relate to particular forms of transnational organized crime. So forestry ministries when it comes to illegal logging or fisheries when it comes to IUU fishing, maybe immigration or internal security when it comes to human smuggling. 
These discussions suggest that improving the mutual understanding of people's roles, responsibilities, and even the occupational constraints of different military, law enforcement, intelligence, and justice officials could help states as a whole take a more proactive or swift stance against organized criminals and their activities. So knowing each other's procedural and operational challenges is a uh, part of the key to coming up with practical and adaptive solutions to dealing with um, TOC in general. A core theme that came through that links into today, above all, was that interagency coordination and transnational coordination to counter transnational organized crime influence each other very significantly. This came up again and again in the presentations and in the Q&A. Um, and to realize the kinds of transnational coordination that is envisioned in things like the Palermo Convention, the UN Convention on Transnational Organized Crime, uh, we need to find ways to make national level coordination more collaborative and streamlined and less competitive and siloed. And, and this leads us into our discussion today um, where we will talk about a variety of different kinds of transnational coordination efforts that are going on on the African continent um, with our distinguished panelists I've introduced. So with that, our objectives for this session today, we hope that the panel will um, facilitate an understanding of why regional and cross-border coordination is important for countering crime and how it's affecting different criminal actors and criminal markets in Eastern, Northern, and Central Africa. We hope that the panel will help you assess current strengths and weaknesses of transnational coordination, whether that coordination is happening uh, between neighboring countries, on the level of the regional economic communities or on the African Union level. And we hope that the panel will help you to identify key strategy, policy, and technical elements of cross-border coordination that have an influence on African states' resilience to multiple kinds of transnational organized crime. So with that, I am honored and pleased to welcome three very distinguished panelists to join me in our plenary discussion of these issues. You have their extensive biographies on the program website, so I will mention just a few things about each of them here before we begin our discussion. First, Dr. Tarek Sharif. He is currently the executive director of Afropol. Uh, he is a specialist in international relations, dynamics, and conflict resolution. He worked uh, for the past 22 years with international organizations on issues related to defense, disarmament and transnational security threats and brings a wealth of expertise and experience um, from these many endeavors to us today. So welcome, Dr. Sharif. Uh, he is not with us yet, but he is in the process of joining us. Dr. Mutoy Mubiala is also going to be with us and he is a French speaker, so I will read his biography out in French as well. Um, il est professeur associé de droit he is an associate professor of law at the University of Kinshasa, who spent much of his career working as a human rights specialist with the Office of the United Nations High Commission for Human Rights. At OHCHR, he has held various United Nations High Commissioner positions, and he has also established the first UN Center for Human Rights and Democracy based in Central Africa for which he was the first director. He participated in several commissions of the UN, including commissions of inquiry, and has had more than 25 years of experience in multiple jurisdictions in relation to capacity building and technical assistance programs as a practitioner. Dr. Mubiala continues to teach international law, has written five, many books and published many articles. And, um, uh, our uh, third panelist, who will actually speak second today, is Commander Abebe Mulune. He is the director of the EGAD Security Sector Program, and he was a police officer in the Federal Democratic Republic of the Ethiopian Police Service between 1989 and 2006. He served at the Ethiopian Police College in various capacities over his career. He's been an instructor, uh, he's been middle-level manager, as well as in the senior management. He has been trained in policing in Ethiopia, Germany, and the USA, as well as Turkey. And since 2006, he has worked in EGAD's security sector program, which is responsible for counterterrorism, maritime security, security institution capacity building, and most notably relevant for our seminar today, 
Countering Transnational Organized Crime. He has authored the EGAD Counterterrorism Training Manual, as well as a book on small arms and light weapons trafficking. So thank you to all three of our distinguished panelists who have um, decided to be here with us today, and we're very honored to have. With that, I think we will jump into the discussion um, with, with all three of you. And I'll start with Dr. Sharif. Um, Dr. Sharif, I'd like to start out by asking you, what are the main ways that Afropol is fostering cross-border coordination of law enforcement activities to counter and prevent transnational organized crime? We're curious to hear a little bit about some of the key strategy, policy, or technical elements of Afropol's coordination efforts. Um, what, should, what should the people in our audience be aware of in relation to that? Um, I'll give you maybe about seven minutes to give us a sketch of what Afropol is up to in this arena. Please. Thank you very much, Mr. Madam Moderator, for giving me the floor and for the invitation. Good afternoon to everybody and also to my colleague panelists. Uh, let me first of all give you uh, just a big, but a picture background about Afripol. Uh, Afripol obviously was established in 2017 with the main objective of strengthening uh, uh, and enhancing cooperation uh, between African police agencies also with the other uh, international law enforcement agencies uh, worldwide. Basically, our uh, police chiefs, inspector generals, and director generals of the African Union wanted to have a structured and more coordinated approach to fight crime and transnational organized crime in our continent. Uh, the headquarter of AFRIPOL is in, based in Algiers, and we've been functioning since May 2017 when we held our first General Assembly of AFRIPOL. So uh, this is just a quick uh, background about our institution. Uh, concerning the question on hand, uh, as, as I have mentioned already, uh, we are a coordination mechanism. So all, most of our work is uh, related to coordination. Uh, so basically uh, to do that, we have to have the right structures within AFRIPOL. So first of all, we started with the establishment of our national liaison offices. So each member state currently has an AFRIPOL office that is basically uh, co communicate, communicating with us uh, on a daily basis. And uh, to do that, we have to also develop our communication system. So we managed to do that as well in 2018. Uh, we have what we call the African Police Communication System, which is AFSICOM, short for AFSICOM. So the, the system is currently working is connecting all our national lines and offices to the AFRIPOL Secretariat in Algiers. But obviously we still uh, did not get to a more technical uh, coordination uh, because the system has to be upgraded. We need to establish our database. Uh, how to establish a database? Of course, you need to start doing uh, cross-border operations to get data. So uh, this is my second point. Now we are moving towards uh, trying to uh, have our first cross-border operation in coordination with Interpol. Uh, we have an operation that will last three months, starting from November. And the outcomes of this operation will be obviously uh, released in a press conference, perhaps in, you know, in February or March. Uh, but because of the, uh, still the operation is still confidential, I cannot get into details of this operation. So in terms of, uh, other types of coordination that we are doing currently. We are working with our regional economic communities within the African continent, uh, also to bring them on board and to at the political level. And also we are coordinating with our regional police chief organizations in Africa, for the Southern Africa, for the Eastern Africa, for the Central and for the West. And uh, also we are, uh, a briefing constantly uh, the African Union Peace and Security Council once a year and also we are working with our uh, 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 other relative uh, our other counterparts AU organs that also they touch on the issue of organized crime and terrorism and currently I am here now in in a coordinating meeting actually I'm in Nairobi we are having our 12th high level retreat on the promotion of peace security and stability in Africa, which is uh, an annual event that is organized by the African Union to bring together all the AU offices and outfits 
to improve our coordination. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, this is what I can say at this, uh, at this stage. Obviously, we are following our work plan that was adopted in 2019. We have a work plan that highlights really our uh, main direction, which as I summarize now, to strengthen our cooperation between our member state and, our, with, and with our uh, counterpart. And also uh, uh, to develop a kind of strategies that will improve uh, our ability to fight crime and organize crime. Currently, we managed to develop two strategies, one in cyber crime and the other one in community policing. And they've been uh, obviously uh, adapted by our uh, national liaison officers experts. And we hope that now our member states can make use of them. Lastly, uh, in, the, in the area of coordination as well, and part of our strategies, we have obviously our annual national liaison offices meeting that they meet once a year. Uh, we had so far two meetings and the objective of this meeting uh, is basically to uh, uh, sit together and uh, strategize uh, and uh, assess our work and see how we can improve our coordination in the area of fighting crime and uh, organized crime. Thank you, thank you. I think I stop at this point. <laughs> Great, thank you for um, describing, um, yes, giving us background on AFRIPOL as a mechanism, as an organization, but then also for, um, yeah, helping us note some useful, maybe some useful resources to consult if people are more interested, the work plan, the strategies that you have come up with already through the um, nationalized offices. Um, it's very interesting. Um, so cyber and community policing as, as your first two strategies that, that the offices have developed. Um, which seem to be pretty cross-cutting for themes of transnational organized crime that we're discussing here as well. So thank you so much, Dr. Sharif, for um, sharing, um, sharing about uh, some of the main strategy, policy, and technical elements involved here with AFRIPOL. Let me follow up with a second question to you. Um, could you uh, provide, based on some of the examples of the work that AFRIPOL has done over the last several years so far, what do you find to have been some of the major successes, some of the core challenges, and then um, some of the emerging good practices for uh, neighborhood, regional, or interregional coordination on transnational organized crime? And um, I'll give you, you have six or seven minutes once again to reflect on that if you wish. Okay, thank you very much. I think this question is more or less linked to the previous one. Uh, what I can say is that, of course, in the area of success, we, we managed to set up AFRIPOL in 2017, uh, as I mentioned, because our uh, uh, chief of police wanted a structured approach. We managed now to have our nationalizing offices functioning. We managed to connect them uh, to our secretariat and focus on some of the immediate uh, threats, which are mainly cybercrime at this stage and other cross-cutting issues that uh, illicit flow of small arms, etc. But obviously, there are challenges, uh, as any other uh, institution might face. For us to be more effective, I think we need to improve our data collection. And for this, we are working on the establishment of our data center. This can be uh, what we call phase two of the African communication uh, system. We, we've done phase one, we established the system, but now we are trying to um, make it uh, more technical. So we will develop our data center. We hope that we will finish it in the next year or so. Uh, we uh, now done the, what we call the assessment uh, of the project and everything is working very well. So hopefully the beginning of this year, our data will start being collected. And obviously the other area that is uh, quite challenging within the African continent is cybercrime. It's, it's, a, it's a threat that is quite complex. And we've recently uh, published a report with uh, in, in joint report with Interpol on the threat assessment, Africa threat assessment uh, cybercrime. And uh, obviously um, the data is quite alarming. I mean, the continent uh, need to strengthen its uh, its uh, ability and its uh, technological tools to fight cybercrime. Because now, and this has been proven during also the COVID-19 period, as most uh, uh, 
transnational organized groups and terrorists were using the web intensively uh, to mobilize resources, recruit, etc. So I think uh, we are trying to, uh, this is a challenge for us. So we, we need to improve on this and bring up our member state to speed, basically, uh, <clears throat> to have a strong, of course, IT uh, within any police force. Now, there should be a basic strong IT uh, section that also can fight crime in uh, this area. So that's why basically we first, first of our first strategy we have developed is our uh, cyber crime strategy. That can be a model uh, for law enforcement within Africa to uh, use it. The other area also, we want to engage our citizen in the area of policing. And that's why we have developed uh, our communication, our uh, community policing strategy. It, it's very important that our citizens uh, become uh, also part of the uh, work that we are trying to do and uh, help law enforcement to combat uh, crime and, and terrorism. So I think uh, these are some of the challenges, some of the successes. At this point, I can stop now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and um, just to clarify, so the information sharing system that Afropol is developing is it is similar? It's similar in design to what Interpol does, but it's it's an African Union led initiative, I, I assume. Yes, of course, it's like the I twenty four seven, but obviously it's it's uh, obviously it's uh, it's for for African uh, Afropol only, but obviously uh, we are. Uh, working with Interpol. So we have also uh, uh, agreement with them to uh, uh, inter in, you know, exchange information. So uh, we, we are not really keeping the information for ourselves. When there is need, we can share information and vice versa. Excellent. OK, very good to know. Well, thank you for sharing um, some of what you think are the key successes and challenges as um, Afropol has uh, you know, gotten itself set up and embarked on the first five years or so of um, work in this domain. Um, this has been a really useful expose um, for us to start out looking on the continental level at what's going on here in terms of um, coordination efforts um, in the law enforcement domain. Okay, excellent. So I'm going to turn to you now and I will ask you two questions so that you can take part in the conversation. Dr. Mubiala, may I ask, can you describe uh, certain of the various items of judicial cooperation, such as extradition, et cetera, other elements that are important for transborder coordination in order to fight transnational organized crime. Why is this judicial cooperation, it, why is it something that the actors of the security sector should really uh, take advantage of? I will give you about seven minutes to uh, answer us. Thank you so much, Catherine. In, in terms of the Great Lakes, as you know, there have been a lot of conflicts uh, in the short, recently in Burundi, in uh, DRC. And uh, there have been serious transnational crimes that have taken place. And so there is also transborder crime and there is illicit trafficking of natural products, of, of natural resources. When we had, uh, we had a conference and we decided to reinforce regional co cooperation to fight against crime. And, and this decision was adopted in Nairobi in December, 2006. And a there was a protocol that uh, allowed for extradition agreements and uh, to have investigations uh, to fight against uh, trans-border crime. But this cooperation was not very effective in, in, in the meantime. So when there was the framework agreement in Addis Ababa for the peace and security in the region of the Great Lakes, the, the, the decisions were to not host criminals and to not protect them against international pursuits. And so that at that time, the governments of the region 
this in 2016 decided to create networks of prosecutors and uh, chiefs of police in the region of the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes region, regarding this security and justice aspects, because we need to fight against impunity and, and to fighting against impunity is a, me, a way of preventing conflicts. So this was uh, created in November 2016. I was able to participate in this meeting and we created the terms of reference. So the main mission is to exchange data between prosecutors, between their representatives, um, police chiefs in order to track criminals in the region. So this, these meetings have been taking place uh, for a while. The first meeting was in 2017 in Khartoum. The second one was in Kampala in 2018. And there was a, the third was in Tanzania and Dar es Salaam. And, in, and the last one was in Brazzaville. And it is the there is a there was a fifth one that was planned, but unfortunately, because of COVID, it was not possible to have this meeting. So the prosecutors, nevertheless, exchange data regarding active investigations. If we're pursuing a terrorist, a specific terrorist, they exchange confidential data. Um, for example, extradition was also implemented. They have also been exchanging good practices, sharing good practices, so that all trans-border crime against uh, uh, the fauna and fauna were uh, targeted uh, poaching. And, and so everything that was dealing with crime against uh, wild species of animals, there was coordination there, and they had uh, focal points um, at the national level to do everything to integrate um, this fight throughout the country. There are challenges because this, the uh, network exists for about five years, but um, dealing in international crime. And this is, um, for the moment, these are the instruments of cooperation and the main points of cooperation in our fight against the uh, TOC in the area of the Great Lakes. Thank you, Dr. Mubiala. I think there's also a problem with your camera. We cannot see you. Oh, I'm going to turn it on. Thank you so much. We see you now. Thank you. It is very interesting what you are telling us in terms of uh, the work between security and justice actors and also what you are doing in the region of the Great Lakes in terms of sharing of information and uh, with the police, the, doing the investigations with the prosecutors who uh, must uh, undertake their legal work to um, to pursue, to do what we call in English, the legal finish after the investigation has taken place. Thank you for having shared this very important link with us that must be strengthened, of course, within different context. It is a, it is a correlation, a link that is not yet very strong, but an area in which we can work harder to strengthen our capacities. For the second question, I would like to ask you, in terms of coordination uh, of security and justice, which you work on, it speaks of the Convention of Kinshasa that was adopted in 2010 and then ratified in 2017. So in terms of this, what were the successes and the challenges in the implementation of this convention? And in terms of the Convention of Conchessa, what does it teach us in terms of the roles of uh, legal harmonization in internalizing of international conventions in the fight against international crime transporter in the region of transporters? Yes, as I told you, thank you for your question. The convention was signed in 2017 
in 2017. So in five years, there will be another meeting of the uh, country members to, to review this convention. Meanwhile, the instruments that are used uh, to, Im to implement the convention uh, uh, to on the internal level of each country um, are in place. Unfortunately, this is going very slowly. Currently, five countries are involved, Angola, um, uh, DRC, Rwanda, and two others. But there is still um, Chad who needs to um, get involved the, um, at a national level. And there's also Gabon to um, that needs to create its national commission. And uh, the president did sign a decree last year to um, initiate this commission. So they wanted to see how these national commissions can meet uh, along with prosecutors to uh, share good practices and have a better coordination. There's a lot of work in preparation that has been um, developed in 2019, 2000, so that by 2023, there will be a much better integration and coordination of these different parties uh, to fight light arms, for example. So we were assisted. I also wanted to add, these states also um, are have signed a treaty against arms trading in the region. And most of the arms in the area, um, there are four states that have ratified this um, fight against, there's the uh, Central Africa, there's Chad, there's South Dominic, excuse me, that ratified this convention, but we would like all the states involved to sign it as quickly as possible. It's very important for the area because it's important that these national commissions are not just existing and creating, but they that they be operational. And that uh, they, they, impl they fight against um, the um, commerce, the trading of arms. And they also we are hoping also that they work with the different international entities uh, and other institutions. It's very interesting to note, as I have mentioned, there are many states that uh, also belong to regional organizations. Burundi with CSC was designated as being a center of excellence in the fight against light arms in um, East African community. Burundi also offered to other states um, the assistance of their center. So, there, so these in the region of the Great Lakes. And so I wanted to end with that. Thank you, Dr. Mubiala, for having described what is taking place in this arena. It seems there is a lot of work yet to be done in terms of operationality. Uh, yes, legally, there are um, established commissions um, and the ratification. Just one moment. I'm going to switch into English just to say I have read an article that Dr. Mubiala has published um, about small arms and light weapons and the Kinshasa Convention. And it's interesting that he says in this article as well, as he was alluding to here, the Kinshasa Convention also has potential to serve as an entry point for the development of trans-regional and inter-regional cooperation between ECAS on the one hand and the other regional economic communities including SADC and ECOWAS on the other. 
He, th he says, this will enable ECAS to benefit from the experience and lessons learned by the latter in the implementation of their respective arms control regimes. The cooperation initiated by ECAS and ECOWAS in the Gulf of Guinea and the Lake Chad Basin is also an important step in that direction. Um, so it seems, um, Dr. Mubiala, you've also thought about other examples of interregional coordination that, that could be useful for um, further advancing some of the legal and judicial initiatives in, in uh, Central African region as well. Um, would you like to say any, any further words about that? I just thought that was a very notable part of your article on this. We. Oui. Yes. In French or in English? Would you like me to speak in French or English, Catherine? It's fine in French. So I wanted to say that the interregional cooperation was very important because in reality, all the subregions are linked in the basin of Lake Chad uh, with, uh, as we know, ECOWAS and the Gulf of Guinea as well. What is going on in the region of the Great Lakes and SADC and the East Africa community? And it is important to see the different entities that exist and that they be able to cooperate, cooperate and, and uh, with good practices so that they can have an efficient impact in the fight against transnational organized crime. And for example, uh, ECOWAS, it's important that these organizations meet up uh, yearly to share their information, their data. In the example of Burundi, it is also possible that the states among, in, in and of themselves that have these instruments can use them, can benefit from them by, and benefit from belonging to different regional organizations and share the information that they have amongst these organizations. This is what I would like to add in terms of interregional cooperation that is a factor in the fight against transnational organized crime in Central Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much for adding that. I think Merci this beaucoup. is an important element um, as well of cross-border coordination. We heard from Dr. Sharif about AFRIPOL and African Union level initiatives. Um, we've heard from you about the RECS, ECAS or the International um, or ICGLR or EAC. Um, and I think as well, thinking about interregionally how the different regional economic communities are working together on some of these issues is another way to approach the question. And if anybody is interested in the previous iteration of this program that we did with Western and Southern African participants, uh, we have a video um, that we can share through the discussion groups with participants where um, Dr. Abdurrahman Yang from ECOWAS spoke to us also about what is going on in the Gulf of Guinea um, between ECAS and ECOWAS and the Gulf of Guinea Commission. It's another very interesting example of interregional coordination um, that Dr. Mubiela alluded to in his article and so um, and, and we just talked about a bit. Now let's go on to hear a little bit about EGAD. I will turn to um, Commander Abebe Molune and ask you um, two questions about what the security sector program has been doing in this domain because there are some very interesting developments there. So first let me ask you what are the main ways that EGAD's security sector program is trying to foster cross-border coordination of law enforcement and justice activities to counter transnational organized crime. Um, we're hoping you'll spend about seven minutes discussing some of the key training and technical elements of EGAD's regional coordination efforts um, and discuss how they fit into your broader strategies. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, uh, Kat. Uh, I would like to appreciate the African Center for Strategic Studies uh, to uh, organize this forum. Uh, plus, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Tariq and Dr. Mubaila for their eloquent uh, and comprehensive uh, presentation. 
of course, uh, I would like uh, to answer the first question within seven minutes, and uh, I will uh, do next uh, the uh, second question later. Uh, actually, I would like to uh, introduce to you all, to all participants, what uh, IGAD Security Sector Program uh, is doing and stand for. Uh, actually, uh, IGAD Security Sector Program superseded uh, the uh, previous program, which was established in 2006, which, which was uh, known IGAD Capacity Building Program Against Terrorism. Uh, the major objective uh, of uh, IGAD Security Sector Program is just to contributing to focus uh, on adapting uh, predictive, preventive, responsive, and adaptive capabilities of member states of uh, IGAD in addressing the existing, evolving, and emerging uh, transnational organized transnational security threats uh, such as terrorism, uh, transnational organized crime. Uh, and seaborne crimes on, of the region and thereby uh, fostering uh, to enable the environment for economic development and regional integration. Uh, to do this, uh, my office, IGAD uh, Security Sector Program, uh, has three strategic priorities. Uh, the first one uh, is enhanced regional cooperation and coordination in preventing and countering existing, evolving, and emerging transnational security threats. The second strategic priority uh, is strengthened institutional and human capacity of IGAD and its member states to effectively address uh, transnational security threats. And the third one is improved progress in ratification, domestication, and implementation of regional and international uh, legal uh, instruments on uh, transnational security threats. To address this, uh, my office has uh, four uh, result areas or units uh, or pillars. Uh, the first one is counterterrorism. Uh, the second one is uh, prevention and containment of transnational organized crime. The third one is maritime security. The fourth one is uh, security institutions capacity uh, building. Uh, in viewing this, uh, I would like to uh, respond for the first question uh, on what are the main ways that my office is trying to foster cross-border cooperation. Actually, uh, IGAD security sector program as a regional organization mandated by uh, IGAD member states uh, supports the efforts of the states in the prevention and countering uh, the overall uh, transnational security threats in which uh, transnational organized crime is the main component. Uh, as you know it very well, organized crime within the region and beyond are cross-border security challenges uh, that affect more than one country. Uh, criminals operate uh, beyond boundaries and jurisdictions in planning, preparing, communicating, and carrying out uh, their illegal activities through creating syndicates networks and groups nationally and internationally. Uh, transnational organized crime are cross-cutting that necessitating uh, intra-agency uh, coordination and cooperation and member states coordination cooperation. Uh, criminals swing across borders seeking for weaker ones. Thus national responses are inadequate. Hence cross-border regional and international uh, cooperation is uh, necessary. Uh, to give you uh, some key trainings and uh, technical elements uh, of uh, IGAD security sectors program, uh, regional coordination to counter crime and how they fit into broader strategy. Uh, my office has been engaged at national and regional levels by uh, creating and delivering uh, need-based and themed capacity uh, building trainings that are aimed to enhance uh, the technical skills and knowledge uh, of the practitioners who are working in law enforcement agencies, as well as the criminal justice sector. Beyond this, uh, these trainings are also aimed at uh, enhancing the multi-agency approach and sharing of information through creating uh, formal and informal networks among the practitioners 
nationally and regionally, which ultimately are intended uh, to contribute to the uh, cooperation and coordination aspect in countering transnational organized crimes. Among the trainings, uh, for instance, uh, we delivered uh, many trainings on human trafficking and migrant smuggling. Uh, we uh, trained uh, law enforcement agencies and uh, criminal justice system on small arms and light weapons, uh, border control management, uh, investigating and prosecution skills, uh, human rights issues, legislative and legal frameworks on, TOS, on uh, transnational organized crime, uh, cyber crime and so on have been extensively covered in various aspects. Uh, technically, uh, this engagement at senior level and policymakers have uh, provided various achievements that have uh, contributed to the national and regional strat strategies in preventing and countering uh, transnational uh, organized crimes. So, uh, my uh, uh, answer for the first question is this. And if you allow me, I will give you uh, the uh, second one. Thank you so much um, for giving us um, a sense of uh, what the security sector program is doing and thinking about in terms of coordination and um, for talking about how this fits, it feeds into national and regional strategies as well, how the training and technical elements, um, the multi-agency approach, the formal and informal networks that you were trying to build through your trainings and technical support play into strategic approaches to this. That's great. Let's indeed pass on to my second question for you, Commander Malone. Um, could you discuss a few examples of the work that the security sector program has done to improve cross-border coordination to counter crime, um, including the plans that I know you have underway for a regional platform on coordination and cooperation? In particular, I'm curious what you think these examples of um, the SSP's work indicate about what the main successes and challenges um, are to coordination in the EGAD um, in the Horn of Africa region. And you'll have seven minutes, about seven minutes again, to tell us what you would like in this domain. Uh, thank you so, so much, uh, Dr. Kelly, again. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, IGAD uh, Security Sector Program has conducting uh, various uh, comprehensive research and the technical capacity building to improve uh, regional uh, coordination and cooperation mechanism. Uh, for instance, we developed uh, IGAD uh, Mutual Legal Assistance uh, and Extradition Conventions. Uh, we established a regional task force uh, and assessed the need, uh, the need and the prevalence of regional cooperation. Uh, we implemented uh, the Transnational Security uh, Threat Initiative, which was launched in mid-2015 uh, uh, and conducted in various uh, phases, uh, whereby we conducted study reports on uh, Al-Shawab as a transnational security threat and the transnational uh, terror threats in the IGAD region, whereby the reports uh, were transmitted uh, to the member states, as well as the United Nations Security Council uh, uh, Committee. Uh, we uh, carried out also the scope and magnitude of transnational uh, organized crime in the EGAD region. Uh, we launched and released a scoping study on the criminal networks and methods uh, of human smuggling and trafficking from Horn of Africa through uh, Central uh, Mediterranean Sea to uh, Europe. Uh, we assessed member states' criminal information system. Uh, we also assessed and identified uh, the national resources, assets, and good practices against uh, transnational uh, security threats, predominantly uh, transnational organized crime, and the status of the ratification and domestication of regional and international normative frameworks uh, on transnational security threats in the uh, aim of developing uh, regional database. Uh, we also carried out a comprehensive uh, regional assessment on existing, evolving, and emerging transnational security threats, predominantly uh, transnational organized crime in the EGAD region and member states. We identified the regional and the country-specific uh, threat analysis uh, and threat vulnerabilities. 
uh, we also conducted a series of capacity building trainings uh, on uh, border security management, aviation security, uh, focusing on the uh, needs and priority uh, areas of the relevant institution at national and uh, regional levels. We also developed uh, uh, EGAD integrated maritime uh, safety and security strategy between the period 2015 to 2030. Uh, we also developed uh, a regional uh, strategy on uh, prevention and countering violent uh, extremism. Uh, as part of regional coordination and cooperation platform mechanism, uh, we, uh, as part of the first strategic area of EGAD security sector program, particularly on promoting regional uh, cooperation and co coordination, we established EGAD security sector program task force uh, comprising uh, of senior security officials uh, from all member states uh, carried out a series of consultation on the regional approach to uh, counter and prevent uh, transnational security threats. Accordingly, uh, we came up with a recommendation to establish a regional cooperation and coordination platform or mechanism against uh, transnational security threats. This uh, platform is intended uh, to create an effective criminal intelligence and information sharing system where regional criminal analysis and mapping, uh, joint planning and operations, uh, assets, resources, and ex expertise sharing, mutual legal assistance, harmonization of policies and legislations, and standardization of uh, systems uh, in preventing and countering transnational security threats become, becomes evident. In order to uh, realize the operationalize of the, the platform, uh, ISSP or EGAD security sector program is engaging in serious consultation at various levels by involving uh, relevant stakeholders. Uh, of course, uh, these are uh, our major achievements. However, there are some uh, challenges uh, actually we faced uh, to establish or to promote coordination and cooperation. The first one, uh, the first challenge is uh, the tense relation between uh, EGAD member states uh, that led to uh, political tension uh, that erode the political commitment of uh, the member states. The second one uh, is internal dispute, uh, conflict and po political instability also affect us. Uh, the third one is uh, undemarcated uh, borders uh, uh, that uh, multiple uh, by uh, porosity, uncontrolled and un unmanaged uh, borders. Uh, the fourth one is minimal contribution uh, of member states. Thus, major programs and projects are donor driven uh, that faces uh, donor fatigue. Uh, the fifth uh, and the very critical one is multiplicity uh, or dual membership uh, of uh, the EGAD member states to other uh, regional uh, economic communities like COMESA, East Africa community, the Arab League and others. So it, it has a co the a question of political commitment uh, and contribution to, uh, to, uh, to regional cooperation and coordination. Uh, in conclusion, uh, regional approach uh, that are uh, um, important for coordination and coordination needed uh, number one, uh, we, we require an institutional uh, legislative and policy framework. Number two, uh, we have to focus on both criminal groups and the uh, vulnerabilities with uh, related market force uh, that countermeasures uh, uh, must disrupt uh, those markets uh, and the force. Uh, we need also to uh, have effective and integrated border security management and control. We have to enhance uh, capacities and capabilities of actors, uh, the law enforcement and including criminal justice. Uh, we have to involve uh, state and non-state actors in cooperation and coordination mechanism. Uh, we have to also uh, uh, make criminal information and intelligence analysis and sharing uh, mechanisms uh, in place. Uh, we have to strengthen governance, security, 
uh, and rule of law and create common understanding and original thinking on threats uh, uh, of uh, transnational uh, organized crime. Over to you, Kat. Thank you so much, Commander Malune. Um, this is very interesting. There are a lot of um, interesting overlaps between what all three of our speakers have said today on the panel, but it's um, particularly what you just noticed about EGAD memberships overlapping with COMESA and East African community and other um, regional organizational memberships. This seems very similar to what Dr. Mubiala was bringing up about the Central African region and some of their overlapping memberships as well. So it seems like, um, you know, um, it's an interesting uh, question maybe for us to continue thinking about in our discussion groups. There's maybe potential there uh, for those overlapping memberships to help us coordinate, but it also makes it more difficult for as you said, um, uh, full coordination and full, maybe full commitment to a variety of different frameworks that countries may be considering based on their different um, memberships in these organizations. And thank you as well for that um, bulleted list at the end of lessons you think, um, good practices um, to follow, lessons you think you have um, learned or gleaned a little bit from EGAD's work um, through the security sector program over the last um, few years. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have each of you on the panel. Um, with us here at the Africa Center. And I think this gives us a really rich snapshot of many different kinds of transnational coordination efforts that are being made across different regions in Africa and on the continental level as well. And so it's hopefully helping us see some of the similarities and differences in the challenges of coordination in different parts of the continent.